but I was real, real comfortable with teaching. And so I was the type of therapist that would go into the classroom and rummage around in the teacher's desk because I knew she had that neat thing with the chalk that you could draw the lines across the board. If I was going to be working on handwriting, I was going to do what she did and I was going to do it in the classroom and not fold out. So I really loved what Julie uh, Marzano um, talked about last um, last week about the fact that um, occupational therapists, especially those in the school system, should not be um, providing one-to-one -one pull out individualized services unless the student's dignity requires that right. to be right. part of the school environment. Um, I was lucky in the school district that I landed in because that was the philosophy. And we wrote collaborative goals and we wrote collaborative progress notes. Mm -hmm. When it was time for progress notes, uh, I didn't have a lot of people coming to me and saying, how's the child doing with handwriting? Everybody knew how the child was doing with handwriting or with um, self-regulation or with um, um, self-help or eating in the cafeteria because everybody knew. Everybody was on the same page. And that was really a valuable experience for all of us. But it also meant that we had to create a lot of materials because we, um, rather than... Um, entering a classroom and doing something separately from what the educator was doing, whether it was preschool or high school, um, I tried to enter the classroom with materials that fit into what was happening in the class. For one occupational therapy is therapists provide assistive technology. And I really would hope that we would de demystify assistive technology by talking about the fact that when we provide these supports as part of our services in the school, they are assistive technology. And you actually found the fact that we could we could have her hand positioned over a, an old dead mouse. Computer mouse, yeah. Yeah, we cut off the cord from a computer mouse and, and tape literally taped the switch in a spot so that her hand was falling, and therefore she didn't have to lift it. it is and it means um, and you'll also see the long term impacts of well, yeah, that'll work, but there's no way they're going to be able to do that long term because the fatigue is going to set in. And the number of things I learned on that. And that uh, event was was actually huge. So um, I, I love the way that you do that with your AT work, and I'd love to see more people learning about uh, uh, about what that approach and how OTs can help that way. Uh, AT can absolutely make an enormous difference in your students. Uh, and I think it's in the DNA of every OT; they just have to own it. It just goes back to the Literacy Bill of Rights. And if you haven't looked at that, it was uh, Yoder, uh, Erickson, and, and Copenhagen, 1997. They created this Literacy Bill of Rights that says everybody has the right to use print. And then there's 15 steps of, I think it's 15, I might have the number wrong, steps of what that looks like, the right to use print, the right to read cereal boxes, the right to talk to people about print, the right to ask questions, and so on. And an adapted book, I guess I didn't really define it, is a book that's been adapted to make it easier to handle, easier to understand, easier to read, easier to see or listen to. Um, it's kind of the gamut. It's just taking um, taking a, a, a book that's already there, or, or also um, you can write your own stories, but making sure that you've considered, uh, David Eddie Byrne calls it the diversity blueprint, taking, making sure that you've considered the, um, the possibility that someone might speak a different language or might understand differently or might move differently. So when you can adapt a book um, or a series of books, maybe using the same book and presenting it in a, a number of different ways, you can meet all these needs so that you don't have, Sally and I always use this example of one student in the classroom, maybe a high school student reading Clifford the Big Red Dog when everybody else is talking about Romeo and Juliet. There's no reason why you can't adapt Rome, Romeo and Juliet. How do we make it easier to, to handle or to use? And so one of the ideas was to, to scan it and laminate it page by page. And there's a number of reasons that you would scan a book and laminate it page by page. One of which is that if it's too overwhelming for the child to read this whole darn book, you can shorten it and you can make it two or three pages and have them have a successful reading experience. And then you can increase and increase and increase. Mm -hmm. And when you laminate pages, you can add information, you can add visuals or things like that. Um, when you scan, you can also take away the extra illustrations so that really you can um, nail down the point of the book because there are wonderful 
uh, kids books out there with beautiful, beautiful illustrations, but sometimes you lose the main point of the page or the text by having too many pictures. Mm -hmm. So when you can scan a book and you can modify it by cutting down on the background or having high contrast or having, um, having the pages easier to turn, you've already created a door that's opening to increased access. And then when you take a look at the print, you might want to change the font. You might want to change the size. You might want to simplify. You might want to put it in Braille. You might want to highlight core vocabulary so that there's all sorts of different ways you can do that as well. You can scan the book, like I said, and cover the, you know, the three, three lines of text with you know, maybe three words that get the point across. Even brown bear can be simplified. Um, what do you see is all you would have to say. You wouldn't have to s repeat all the animals' names and all that kind of stuff. You could, right. you could simplify it and then add to it. And the more you um, take a book apart and, and have parts that are moving and can be easily changed, the easier it is to modify that same book for whatever um, individual needs to have those modifications. When we scan these, sometimes we would turn it into a PowerPoint and sometimes we would add animation or we, we record our voice so that they could have the, the uh, story, they could have um, the ability to turn the pages using a switch rather than them turning the pages with their, their hands or right. their feet. Caps for sale, thank you, Denise. That's, That's what it was. Caps it takes sale. a village. That's why we collaborate. <laughs> So they had t it taken bottle caps and they'd put little plaid and pom poms and everything. They'd made all sorts of, they made a hundred oh. different caps. They had numbers, they had letters, they had all sorts of things. And they had also physically adapted the books. And so there were page fluffers and they had, um, they had uh, um, put the, the books on um, a harder surface and they'd laminated it and then put Velcro and things like that. So it's like, wow. I like that. I like to do that. Um, but also repetitive books are good because yeah. that does get the reader, especially a reluctant reader, to anticipate because they hear the rhythm. And then um, using a lot of those kinds of repetitive books can create interest and create success because they, you know, they have heard the, the refrain enough so that they can start um, looking at those words and anticipating that those words have something to do with that refrain. And that's right. not to take away from the fact that everybody should, thank you, Alyssa, you say it so much better. You should be talking <laughs> instead of me. She it already you, did. She already did. I know, I know. It allows you to focus on the salient details of the image and or the text. That's exactly right. And so we thought that probably we could make these books more memorable and also um, increase the opportunities for for increased comprehension if we had activities that went along with them. So, Once so, we had chosen a book, then we wanted to stretch that book. We wanted to have um, activities that, that focused on literacy. We wanted to, to um, target the core vocabulary that we found in the text. We wanted to maybe have a citizenship type of um, emphasis. What could you learn about Brown Bear? Is he looking for his friends or whatever? Um, we wanted to have um, a communication focus. We wanted to have math and science. We also wanted to um, to look at, and I'm looking at my notes because I don't remember all the things we had. We wanted skilled movement opportunities for, for um, one of our nursery rhyme types of books. We had cows, uh, kids jumping over the moon like the cow jumped over the moon. We had those little lights from the Dollar Tree and they had to jump over the moon or put their wheelchair over the moon or their scooter board over the moon so that they could understand over because we, we did um, have them do some writing if they could about some of these stories. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure that we went full blown um, alternative pencils, but we, we certainly were um, going in that direction with giving them writing opportunities and drawing opportunities so they could recall whether this was part of our pizza pizza um, book. So they would get their, their pizza pizza book. They got a Doug and Melissa pizza. They got a Doug and Melissa puzzle. They got anything else that we could find um, that had to do with pizza, pizza menus and things. But then we, we really teased it out more. We had, um, here's a, uh, I, this was from Melissa and Doug. It was pick, pick your toppings so that they could do some um, designing of their pizzas and they, they could uh, uh, count the numbers of peppers and things like that. We had our thematic literacy planner in there. 
we had, um, let's see, what else do we have? We had um, a core vocabulary board on the kind of the word, uh, the reading words that they might use when they were looking at the storybook. Here's a, a patterns for, for finding the pattern with the pizzas. Right. Here are um, the um, help the chef get to the pizza. So there's the chef and they could do that with a wiki stick. They could trace it, they could cut it, but there are all sorts of different lines. We had um, make the, the letter P for pizza with pom-poms. Um, it goes on and on, practicing handwriting um, with, with um, pizza words. Um, and we had box and dots and lined paper and all sorts of different things, drawing a picture of the favorite pizza and writing a sentence. Um, there was even rolling the pizza um, to, pick, to pick your toppings. Um, we had uh, graphing, uh, graphing the pizza. We had pizza um, to math and clothespin cards and everything. And then Lesson Picks came up with In a Story. And if you take a look at In a Story, and you guys are going to have to show this, not only did Lesson Picks come, in, uh, come up with In a Story, but In a Story came after having all these templates with all these different themes. Because it uh, helps kids... Um, comprehend and then generalize that information to new situations if there's some sort of familiarity, if we're not throwing new skills to them every time we present a, a different theme, but but they continue to work on their math skills or their writing skills or their or their um, uh, problem solving skills in in each of the um, the stories that we present to them so that they're they are um, able to generalize it as opposed to just oh now I got to have a new skill set because we're talking about a different story so th that's the nice thing about having those templates and having those available where all you have to do is change one thing the, right. you know you're still working on cutting the circular line but now you're cutting around brown bear instead of um, polar bear or something like that right. oh yep. we didn't talk about the little circles that you can do too you can do those in lesson picks little circles of the the different pictures that you might use in adapting books you can glue them on poker chips and um, um, put them on a paint stick for sequencing the parts of the story and then when they hear certain parts they pull them off and they put them in a coffee can and it makes a clank noise so there's a little sensory component so anyway if um, anybody's interested in um, in taking a course for free um, three-part course um, I think you can get uh, credit for it, you get a certificate. Um, take a look at Virginia's TTAC, um, and we can probably guide you to the the course itself too. So, yeah. with that. so I would pay attention to what the teacher was was doing, um, and they're doing so many things right, and they don't always get that feedback. And so noticing what they were doing right, but also noticing like. Um, I remember walking into this one classroom and they were talking about Egypt and I had happened to have been to Egypt. And so I brought something from Egypt the next time that I went into the classroom and I talked to the teacher about, um, you know, this experience and, and shared something from me and something that they might be able to use in the classroom. Um, so I was bring gifts, chocolate, you know, hieroglyphics, whatever. Wrong. You know, there is a, a collaborative document written for um yeah, sure. Alyssa, it's it's asha ot and apta about working together that it's it's not um belly button up and belly button down like it was when when that was the way that people used to define ot and pt years and years and years ago you know <laughs> there you go really the definitions of ot was um skills for the job of living and in schools uh you translate that to skills for the job of learning, and then it's everybody's share. Everybody has a share in that. Um, when I was when I was uh, in OT school, we had to make all our equipment, um, so there was a lot of problem solving involved. We didn't have a lot of the catalog things that we have nowadays because you know I'm old. But um, seriously, we did we did do a lot of adaptations. We were the makers. We made splints for for hand uh, positioning and function. We made um, uh, writing tools and feeding tools and, and things like that. We made dressing tools because um, they just weren't readily available. But any of, the, of those low tech things that, that people come up with, the crazy things that look kind of silly and everything else, those are prototypes. They're wonderful prototypes for something that might be very expensive and shiny and clean, but it's gonna fit. 
You right. really need to, to have yep. those customizations in order to make it right for that one individual person because nobody fits the same way and nobody moves the same way. Here's our, our Here's a new template. New template. Yeah. It is a new style of a current template it is in our books and stories. Um, but Judy said, you know, you really need to make mini books. And the instructions tell us very clearly. Hold it like a hot dog. Judy, what was your your keywords or mnemonics? Hot dog fold. Hot dog fold. And there then you open it up and make a hamburger fold. Hamburger fold. Let's get that going right on the line. All right. And, and then, then on our instructions, down. we kind of and close our book. And our book is called I See Spring. And it's like magic. It just works. <laughs> it just works. And now we have an eight page mini book. What can you do? You can sequence the steps to getting the cafeteria. You can put uh, pictures of your best friends in it. You can do anything that you want with it. Well, what kind of advice are they looking for other than they made the best choice for occupation? Yeah, they'd be a cheerleader. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be glib. I mean, I really do believe that this is a wonderful field, but I don't know exactly what I tell them other than find a mentor right away. Right. My mom is 103. She's going to be 104 on the 4th of July, God mm -hmm. willing. And um, she's receiving um, OT services. Um, and uh, it is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to see what our profession does throughout the lifespan. Um, uh, there's certainly things that I, I can do to help my mom, but there's, the, you know, the uh, living in someone's shoes and understanding what they do um, from a therapy standpoint, regardless of the age group, like, uh, you know, going back to what Julie talked about, what, what, uh, um, Alyssa talked about with the first session, what Debbie is going to talk about knowing well, what that particular group that you're focusing on is all about makes all the difference in the services you provide. So uh, I have so much respect for um, the OTs that work with the older population and the things that they can do that that should come, you know, a little bit more natural naturally to me as as an OT. Um, it's it's a it's it's a mindset that you. You really have to know who you're working with. And um, even though I know my mother very well, there's certain things that I didn't think of because I was so focused on being her daughter and, right. and making sure that she was safe. So um, just it's a wonderful field. And I'm, right. grateful. I'm grateful for that opportunity to, to be an OT.